gonna take me to the grave Broken sparrow, I can't sing no more A cold wind howling at my door it's a long road down, a long road down, it's a long road down, a long road down, it's a long road down, a long road down, it's a long road down, yeah, long Hi, my name is Dr. Paul T. Carter. I'm coming to you from Bangkok. Thank you for watching the video. Today I'm going to tell you about how Thailand won the Second Indochina War. The expression of this idea was first formulated, as far as I'm aware, by Dr. Richard Ruth in the New York Times editorial and I encourage you to read it. I've put the URL in the comments page below. Dr. Ruth is a professor at the Naval Academy, former chair of the history department. He's written a wonderful book called In Buddha's Company about the Thai soldiers in the Vietnam War. I highly encourage you to read. He was a mentor of mine for my master's thesis and I definitely have learned a lot from him. So this idea originally came from him, and when I read his editorial, it got me to thinking, how was it that Thailand was able to win the Second Indochina War? What decisions did the government make to win the war? What measures did the government take? Because you know, during the Second Indochina War, or Vietnam War, the People's Republic of China and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the DRV, North Vietnamese, targeted four countries for communist expansion. When the smoke cleared, only one had repulsed the communist aggression, and that was Thailand. And it's actually a remarkable story. So that's the story that I'm going to tell you today, how they did that. Now, I need to give you just a little bit of background. I need to give you some context for this. Sometimes you will read some writers who will say the communist threat to Thailand was not that great. And these are predominantly Thai academics who reside in the U.S. And they cite two reasons. And they say that, first of all, Thai dictators during the war embellished the communist threat, the specter of the communist threat. And in fact, they did. I cite a couple of examples in my book. And then they conclude, therefore, the threat must not have been that great. But you see, even though that some Thai dictators did embellish the threat, uh, the threat still was great. These two facts are not in contravention. And the facts speak for themselves. Over 20,000 Thai officials lost their lives during the Second Indochina War through assassination. Doctors, teachers, village headmen, uh, provincial governors were assassinated. There were large swaths of territory in the north and the northeast that the communists controlled. You can read about this in the Bangkok Post. Also, the Thai government constructed fire bases on its own territory, Kokao in Pechabun province, for example, where it conducted fire missions on its own territory in support of its infantry troops in pitched battles. As my friend, retired Special Forces Army officer Chuck Kruger points out, for a government to construct a fire base on its own territory to conduct fire missions on its own territory in support of its infantry fighting an enemy is all you need to know about how big the communist threat was. So I will get into this. Now the second thing that some on the right actually point out, they say, well, the Thai did not possess the cultural characteristics to succumb to 
communism. Now they're really talking about the central tie, the Bangkok tie. And they say the love of monarchy, uh, being Buddhist, a individualistic versus collectivist uh, mentality. Well, those on the far left, the Thai that are Marxist or quasi-Marxist or Marxist writers say that these arguments are not valid. They say they are just constructed by the right to, um, to really mitigate, to dismiss the concerns uh, that the dispossessed had. And they point out that the Lao and the Khmer uh, jettisoned their monarchies and they were Buddhist and they were monarchical. So regardless of the validity of this argument, I think you have to understand that a communist insurgency in Thailand did not have to be on the palace steps in order to threaten Thailand. Had an insurgency continued, a simmering insurgency in the Northeast and the North, then that would have created debilitating conditions for Thailand. Uh, and employment would increase, disease would increase, it would have impacted tourism. Henry Kissinger points out that in insurgency, a government loses by not winning. And an insurgency wins by not losing. So had the insurgency held out, it would have had debilitating effects upon Thailand. But in fact, the Thai government exterminated the insurgency, and that was quite a significant development. Now finally, I will tell you that Thailand did possess some characteristics in its favor that the other countries did not possess. First of all, it was the country furthest from Hanoi and from China, so it had a geographical advantage. It also had the Mainam Kong, or the Mekong River, on its border. Additionally, uh, Thai peasants, Thai rural population possessed land, uh, unlike in the other countries. And so that was one less grievance that the communists could exploit. Also, the Thai rural Thai built their homes on stilts, uh, whereas in the other countries they built on the ground. And so from a tactical advantage, that prevented tunnels from coming up under the homes. So now, without further ado, I'm going to get into the decisions that the Thai government made, the measures it took to win the Second Indochina War. Here are Communist Party of Thailand, CPT, fighters. And before I describe the Thai government actions to defeat the communist insurgency and repulse foreign aggression during the Second Indochina War, I do want to provide some facts not assessment, regarding the insurgency to demonstrate its strength. By 1984, approximately 22,000 Thai government officials had been assassinated, from school teachers to village headmen to provincial governors, such as Prayad Samanmit, Chiang Rai provincial governor killed in 1970. Even royalty was murdered. Communist insurgent ground fire killed Princess Vihavadi Rajani, known for her rural development work and as a writer, on February 16, 1977, while airborne in a helicopter on a routine visit to assist rural villagers in South Thailand. In Northeast Thailand, the Isan region, which was Thailand's poorest largest geographically and most populous region, eight to 14,000 CPT fighters controlled approximately 250 liberated villages. Isan was the heart of the insurgency. By early 1970s, insurgents were organized for conventional ground fighting. In March 1972, at Hen Rongkla, a guerrilla base in Pechabun province, an estimated 10,000 Thai troops engaged an insurgent force of several hundred. Ten months later, more than 3,000 Thai troops, supported by aircraft and artillery, engaged a 1,000-man insurgent force in Trang province. These battles are well documented in the Bangkok Post and other media. 
From Rice Fields to Rebellion, Untold Stories of Northeastern Thailand's Armed Struggle is an article where former CPT members who received amnesty tell their stories of training in northern Vietnam and China. On the right, Kim Porn Chua Tuamun, alias Comrade Firet At, was a Thai communist fighter who now sells life insurance in Isan. On the left, Comrade Usa, in March 1966, at age 16, walked from her home in Nakhon Panom province to northern Vietnam, where she stayed for two years to receive medical training and language training before returning to fight with the communist movement in Thailand. The communist insurgency in Thailand ended in 1984, nine years after the fall of no. Pen, Saigon, and Vientiane. Now I will discuss Thai actions and decisions that provided the Thai victory in the Second Indochina War. And the first decision was boldly to align with the U.S. After World War II, the world divided into the communist versus free world, and a cold war ensued. Some countries desired neutrality through an international non-alignment movement, exemplified by the Bandung Conference. But neutrality would prove to be a hard and fruitless position to maintain. Meanwhile, immediately post-war, Great Britain was pushing for war reparations against Thailand. The U.S. came to Thailand's defense, partially because of the personal and professional ties between the Americans in the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, forerunner of the CIA, and the Seri Thai, or Free Thai, who had opposed the Japanese occupation of Thailand during the war. The Thai dictator Pi Bun determined that Thailand could best advance by aligning with the U.S. in the coming Cold War, and the U.S., Likewise, by the late 1940s, had decided Thailand was the Southeast Asian country best positioned to serve as a bulwark against the coming communist fight. Thailand took great risk in siding with the U.S. The PRC and North Vietnamese were determined to wipe all vestiges of U.S. influence from Asia, and Thailand became an even larger communist target because of its U.S. alliance, including bombastic public threats from Beijing. American resolve in Korea in 1950 convinced Thai leadership and Pibun that the U.S. was a country that could come to its aid, and Thailand sent soldiers to fight in Korea, the first Asian country to do so. The significance of this cannot be overstated. Daniel Feynman writes, Quote, the dispatch of the expeditionary force aligned Thailand firmly with the West and decisively against the communists. No longer merely talking about doing something about communists, Thais were now actually killing them. P. Boon's decision made him a declared enemy of Stalin's and Mao's North Korean allies. It ended the field marshal's policy of maintaining friendly relations with the communist powers. Demonstrating the depth of his commitment to the West after the dispatch of troops, Pibun had Thailand vote in the UN in February 1951 to censor the Chinese intervention in Korea. And in May 1951, Thailand voted in favor of a strategic embargo of China. Before 1950, such boldness was unthinkable. The recognition of Bao Dai and the dispatch of troops, however, had brought Thailand to the heart of the Western camp, and there was no turning back. Kislinko writes, quote, Thailand risked a great deal in its association with the United States. Helping Americans to defend Thailand from invasion or insurgency was one thing, but assisting in wars elsewhere was quite another.
In the old days, a languid had settled over the city once dark. Now, Bangkok swings at night. Thousands of colored neon signs proclaim the city's bars, bathhouses, massage parlors, and dozens of luxurious nightclubs, each with its pretty Thai hostesses. These spots are the favorite. <laughs> The next Thai action that helped to provide war victory was to allow the CIA to create internal security programs. In 1951, an unassuming Texan named Bill Lair came to Thailand as a CIA operative to conduct this task. The Pibun administration and CIA in 1951 established the Thai Border Patrol Police, or BPP, to gather intelligence and conduct unconventional warfare in Thailand's remote border areas where no law enforcement existed. Lair was assigned to train the BPP and he created an even more elite paramilitary organization within the BPP, the Police Aerial Reinforcement Unit, or Peru. Peru deployed to Laos as well. The princess mother became the royal patron of the BPP. The mother of King Rama IX, Princess Mother Sangwan, was once a young nursing student in Massachusetts where her son, the king, was born. The Thai called her Mae Fa Luang, Great Mother of the Sky, perhaps because she arrived in helicopters to remote villages. These programs significantly enhanced the Thai ability to protect Thailand's northern borders. For any country to give such license to the CIA is a bold move and obviously incurs risk. Bill Lair was made a colonel in the Thai police, an almost certainly unprecedented appointment for a CIA officer. He was a close friend of Thailand's king, conducting boating and marksmanship activities with His Majesty Rama IX, and Lair married the sister of Thai Air Marshal Sit Savitsila, a Seri Thai movement member during World War II, whose grandfather was the British consul in Siam during the reign of King Rama IV, and an advisor to King Rama V. Seat's other sister married American Willis Bird, a previous OSS member who owned the CIA proprietary airlines Bird Air, later Bird and Sons. This is an example of where the OSS and Seri Thai connections in World War II paid dividends for the Thai and Americans post-war and Bill Lair's efforts in establishing professional Thai paramilitary police greatly enhanced Thailand's security posture. Another Thai action and decision that provided the Thai victory in the Second Indochina War was Thai economic development and aid and Thai state extension. It is now proven empirically that economic development and aid to a population is a positive counterinsurgent tool 
to combat insurgency. This topic was the basis of my PhD dissertation and the U.S. was the provider in funding this massive development program. Also in counterinsurgency studies, the powerful role of external actors to influence outcomes is clear. Three regional actors, the PRC, Patet Lao, and DRV, or North Vietnamese, sponsored the Thai insurgency. The RAND Corporation Seminole 2013 counterinsurgency study conducted for the U.S. Office of the Secretary of Defense empirically examined every insurgency since World War II and found that external support to insurgents is a strong indicator for host nation defeat. In fact, external support plays such a powerful role in tipping the balance that since World War II, quote, every case in which a major external power supported the insurgents and was not balanced by a major external power supporting the host nation ended up being an insurgent win and host nation loss. This finding iterates the important role foreign support plays and underscores why U.S. support to Thailand played a pivotal role in the counterinsurgency fight. It is riding the crest of an unprecedented economic boom. A visiting World Bank mission surveyed Thailand's economy recently and was flabbergasted to learn that it's expanding at a rate of 10% a year, almost twice that of even the most prosperous Western countries. Thailand's economic development was conducted on a scale rarely paralleled in modern history. The United States infused almost $3 billion into the Thai economy over three decades, which greatly facilitated Thailand's rapid modernization and helped defeat the insurgency. Three U.S. billion in 1984 is about $7.5 billion in 2019. In 1949, Thailand had only 845 kilometer of all-weather roads and rickety wooden bridges. By 1964, it had 15,000 kilometers to include the massive Friendship Highway, opening up Isan for farmers to export their produce. In 1950, there were only 20 Thai hospitals for the entire country. By 1955, there were 71 one for every province. By 1954, U.S.-sponsored agricultural experimentation resulted in a 15% increase in the rice yield, reducing the long-term trend of declining yields. By 1956, 50 different rice strains had shown a 13 to 32% yield increase. Prior to 1950, Thai malaria deaths averaged over 45,000 annually and many man hours were lost to sickness. The Malaria Eradication Program, funded largely by the U.S., cut the Thai malaria death rate in half between 1950 and 1954 and by 1966 in excess of 90%. The economic development to enhance national security included massive road, health, irrigation, new crops, fertilizer, and human capital training. In the 1950s, Thailand's economy grew on average by 5% per annum, increasing to a 1960s average of 8.4% and 7% for the 1970s. Standard measures of human well-being increased, such as infant and child mortality and disease rates, life expectancy, health status, and literacy. Robert Muscat argues that the U.S.'s greatest contribution to Thailand was the massive formal human capital training of over 100,000 Thai by American university professors, business executives, and civic leaders over several decades. Between 1950 and 1996, more than 11,000 Thai were trained in the United States. More than 100,000 Thai received in-country training from U.S. educators and civil servants in agricultural productivity, 
science and technology, health and family planning, governmental processes, and infrastructure development. Now certainly, economic development brought problems, as it always does, and I detail those in my book. Nonetheless, even those who take a less favorable view of development, such as Jonathan Rigg, state, quote, Thailand's poverty rate has declined to such a degree and such a clip that extreme poverty has been eradicated. This is arguably the single greatest success of Thailand's development project. Finally, in surveys and studies Thai universities and other agencies conducted of the rural population during this period, villagers stated overwhelmingly that the economic development had given them confidence in the Thai government and demonstrated that the government cared for them. The development truly had a significant positive counterinsurgent effect, which is no surprise, this is what empirical studies tell us as well. While insurgents were burning hospitals, killing teachers, and discouraging villager use of fertilizer and irrigation that the Thai government provided, the population was getting healthier and more prosperous. The empirical evidence from these rural surveys show that economic development blunted the insurgency. The next factor was the Thai king, Rama IX, who was a forceful opponent of communism. His majesty was a potent force in holding his country together against the communist onslaught. He was not only loved, but veritably worshipped by many Thai. Love of a monarch is not automatic, and when he took the throne in 1946, the monarchy was in a very weakened state. From his palace, the 23-year-old monarch took his place on the palanquin to be borne in procession to the temple of the Emerald Buddha. The umbrellas of nine circles denote the presence of the king. Only royalty can use these umbrellas. For persons of lesser rank, there are fewer circles. But his tireless devotion to his subjects earned him almost godlike status. He fired up the public, often dressing in battle fatigues when traveling outside Bangkok, with a pistol at his side, and the Thai press carried photos of him firing weapons inside Thai army camps. As noted by Dr. Richard Ruth, the king, by the late 1960s, began to openly advocate military action against communist forces in the region. The king was the first Thai king to visit the remote northeastern parts of Thailand, and he and his convoy covered about 30,000 miles per year. He liked to drive himself. It gave him a feel intuitively of what the people and land needed. He conducted over 800 engagements per year. Here, Her Royal Highness Queen Sirikit greets locals during their majesty's tour of the region in 1955. The trip covered 14 provinces over 19 days and was the beginning of a tradition of upcountry visits to remote areas that was to continue throughout most of his reign. Every time he stepped into a new village, he extended the Thai state. While Thai state extension included the civil and military penetration of parts previously inaccessible in Thailand, he personally extended the Thai kingdom as his presence solidified fealty to the state. It was the king's efforts in mobilizing the population against communism and in supporting the war effort Thailand deployed troops to both Vietnam and Laos, that created sustainable forces to defeat communism. Had His Majesty passively sat on the sidelines, then most likely a less effective, more costly, and more deadly outcome in the fight against communism would have resulted. Grandniece and her youngest daughter is uh, more than 40, eight children. <laughs> She's a little bit shy of the camera, so I tell her to, to smile. The next decision that helped Thailand defeat its insurgency and resist foreign aggression was Thailand's rapprochement with the PRC. In 1972, U.S. President Nixon went to China, opening up relations between the two countries. Meanwhile, the U.S. was pulling out of Southeast Asia, leaving Thailand largely alone, except for U.S. funding, of course, in a region fueled by war. The PRC was the primary supporter of the Communist Party of Thailand, the CPT, and part of Thailand's motive in its outreach to the PRC was to sever ties between the PRC and CPT. A joint Thai-slash-PRC communique 
was signed on July 1, 1975, but some Thai felt Thailand's prime minister had compromised on the PRC's support to local insurgents, and in fact, PRC support to insurgents continued. But a gift of sorts came to Thailand on Christmas Day, 1978. The Vietnamese invaded Cambodia and the Sino-Viet Rift was in full display. Thailand advantaged this rift between the PRC and Vietnamese. The Vietnamese were in control of Cambodia and Vietnamese forces were positioned on the Thai border. This created a massive refugee problem for the Thai with Cambodians fleeing into Thailand and military border clashes were occurring between Thai and Viet forces. Thailand now faced a dilemma. Ten Vietnamese divisions in Cambodia on Thailand's threatened border while also combating an internal insurgency. All this time, the war with the communists gets worse. There are communist insurgents on all Thailand's borders, Burma and Malaysia, as well as with communist Laos and Cambodia. The Thai government will not release casualty figures, treating this as secret information. But the most recent figures obtainable date from 1977, when it seems that about 600 government troops were killed, though the insurgents' radio claimed six times that number. All we know is that the war has got worse since then. There are probably about 10,000 communist guerrillas in Thailand. Parts of Thai territory are now totally controlled by the insurgents. Now Vietnam has invaded Cambodia and could very easily invade Thailand. They have 10 divisions on the Thai border. Altogether, their army has 600,000 well-trained soldiers, 1,450 tanks, and 1,300 combat aircraft. Against this, Thailand has 141,000 troops, 150 light tanks, and 149 aircraft. The king is acutely aware of Thailand's danger. The first uh, thing is security. That is, the, the security of the Thai, the, the people, the Thai people have to, to fight for their freedom, for their uh, independence. So the main thing is to, to be a good general. And then after that, when a country is more settled, it's to have uh, law and order, That's law and uh, administration. Royal Thai Army Major General Chavalit flew to Beijing and essentially cut a deal with the Chinese. Thailand could be a good friend to the PRC and could act as a restraint to the Vietnamese, but the PRC needed to cut ties to the CPT. The PRC began to do so, shutting down the communist radio Voice of the People of Thailand and decreasing its support of the CPT. The Vietnamese, in control of Laos, Kicked out of Laos, Sino favoring CPT cadre, so a CPT haven was lost. The CPT support structure began to dwindle. Around the same time, the Thai government began offering amnesty to CPT leaders. This was another Thai move that proved to be successful. The first official amnesty act was in 1978 by Prime Minister Kring Sak for college students involved in the so-called 1976 uprising, which was in fact an unlawful government massacre of students. In 1980, under Prime Minister Prim, the Thai government had reversed its heavy-handed tactics against insurgents and extended amnesty actions. Thailand's 1980 policy to win over communism, Order 66-25-23, policy stated that communist terrorists Repentant defectors or prisoners must be dealt with as fellow countrymen and reintegrated into society. Over the next four years, groups of insurgents began surrendering until the insurgency flickered out by 1984. Well, thank you very much for watching the video. I also want to thank you Americans who are watching, who were here in Thailand at the time and contributed to this Thai victory against communism. 
Many of you were working, laboring on behalf of the U.S. government and the Thai government, but you were also doing other things, uh, such as volunteering, charity work, um, civil military affairs, uh, participating in church activities. I've read about these, and I think the American effort here is, is laudable, and I want to thank you. The Peace Corps volunteers who were here, doing many things, out in the jungle, getting malaria, spraying uh, homes, many sacrifices, digging irrigation ditches, uh, the Special Forces personnel who were training the Thai and who deployed with them to Vietnam and to Laos, USAID personnel who were here uh, conducting all of the development that I have just talked about, uh, the educators who came here. Uh, we had missionaries who did a lot of work here. We had Air Force personnel scattered among the seven bases uh, in the area and in addition to the work you did for the US government you were also out doing charity work in the community I've read about that and I want to give a special shout out to the first of the 56th special operations wing or special operations warriors uh, as I call them there were also Americans in the US that hosted Thai families uh, and Thai students when they came to the US to train so all of these efforts contributed to the victory against communism in Thailand. Now, I want to tell you that not all Thai actions against the insurgency were productive. There was one action that was so egregious and widespread over a period of several decades that it actually fueled the insurgency. All counterinsurgency modeling literature and studies are in agreement on this point, and that is if a host government takes this action, insurgency will increase. In fact, one study showed that if a government did this, that the insurgency will increase without ever having to conduct a recruiting campaign. Thai on the left, former communists, former military members, those on the right, uh, Thai scholars are all in agreement that this Thai action fueled the insurgency and that was Royal Thai Army abuses against civilians in conducting the insurgency. Now I want to read to you from General Prim's book. He was the Thai Prime Minister from 1980 to 1988. He was the Deputy Commander of Military Region 2 uh, in the Thai Army. He says that the reason for the hatred against soldiers was fairly easy to ascertain. Along with the body count theory that pervaded military thinking at the time, some of the soldiers assigned to the Northeast had been arresting innocent people, raping girls, and creating a general climate of distrust. In other words, behaving just as the insurgent leaders said they would. Now this is from a military man, and other military leaders have written this. Now fortunately, uh, General Prim, General Sayud, Kurt Pohl, and others were forward-thinking in this counterinsurgency fight, and they eventually became the leaders of the Thai military, and so they were able to turn this around and get the entire Thai military to practice proper counterinsurgency procedures, but that didn't occur until the late 1970s. So had the Thai military uh, conducted proper counterinsurgent principles early on, then I certainly think that the insurgency would not have been as violent uh, as it was. Now, I need to inform you that there is another body of thought and literature on why the CPT failed. And this comes from former CPT members and those on the left who have written about this. And of course, they don't give much credit to the Thai government for it. They give some but not much credit to the Thai government for defeating the insurgency, and that's understandable. But what they do do is they point out systemic endemic problems within their movement. And the first one is that you had a CPT leadership embedded in Beijing, and then you had the CPT fighters uh, here in Thailand, and there was an ideological uh, and a cultural gulf and divide between those two. The first problem that most say was the most serious problem was that the CPT conducted a Maoist rural campaign rather than a urban campaign. Let me read to you what uh, Ji Ungaporn 
wrote about this and he outlines what may have been the CPT's most basic foundational miscalculation. And he says, the communists mistakenly believed that Thailand was a semi-feudal half colony of the United States and the only way forward was to lead a Maoist struggle in the countryside. But Thailand was already a capitalist country. Major struggles had taken place in urban areas and the only way forward was to lead the urban struggle. So you see this disconnect between the CPT and Thailand and Beijing in another way as well. And that's in the early 1980s when the PRC leaders, the Chinese leaders, were talking to the Thai leaders. The CPT here in Thailand felt disenfranchised. And in 1982, there was a mass surrender of about 1,000 CPT fighters in Muktahan. And the leader said the reason they surrendered was, quote, the result of the fourth Communist Party Congress did not represent the voice of the Thai people. And that Fourth Party Congress had occurred in 1982. So really just this broad disconnect. Now you see these disconnects in other places. You see it in 1973. At that time, there were about a half a million, according to some estimates, Thai personnel on the streets protesting in Bangkok. Lots of labor and other unrest. Now, with that many people on the street protesting, that would have been a perfect time for the rural population to rise up. But they did not. Why? Well, they were pacified by this time. According to Latine and Ferron, the answer is economics. So the Thai government had been conducting economic development and aid in the rural areas for a couple of decades. Now, by the time 1973 rolled around, the people in the rural areas had jobs, they had health care, yeah, they were doing okay. Now for a revolution or an insurgency or a civil war to succeed, you have to have a large number of disgruntled, unemployed, military-aged males to take up arms, and you just didn't have that. Young men were in Bangkok working, sending money back to their families, or they were on their rice farms, and they were, they were doing okay, and it's, they're probably not going to abandon their jobs, abandon their family, abandon their health care, and run to the jungle and pick up a gun. So I credit the Thai government uh, for conducting efforts and for setting the conditions to pacify the rural Thai in that way. You see another disconnect in 1976. At that time you had what's called the Thomasat Massacre. You had Thomasite University students who were protesting in October 1976 and right-wing militias essentially just came in and slaughtered them. So as a result, many of the leftist students here in Bangkok fled to the jungles to join the CPT. There were several thousand. Now that should have been a time of great energy. It should have been a time of adding intellectual heft to the movement. You have new blood coming in. But when they arrived at the CPT locations uh, in the jungle, the CPT essentially said, thank you, welcome, here's a shovel, now go dig a foxhole. So I think at the end of the day that those on the left do point out endemic problems uh, with their movement. Every movement has systemic endemic problems, but ultimately the Thai government defeated the insurgency. Well, thank you very much for watching. Some of you have asked me for sourcing information or citations based on my last video. What I would recommend you do is go to academia.edu and download for free my book because all of those citations and sourcing is in the book. I don't mind directing you there because everything I do is free and that book all my books, all my articles are free for download. So I want to thank you again for watching. And remember, tough times don't last, tough people do. From Bangkok.
long day. Uh, working on the railroad. Just to pass my time away. Can't you hear the whistle?